looks like <laughs> Kevin has joined us too. Right? Good to see you, Kevin. Um, not, not the Dr. Kevin, the other Kevin. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I was thinking a little bit, Matt, about what you told me from your experience mm -hmm. last night. Um, and it kind of relates to what we're talking about, but without naming the venue, do you feel comfortable talking about your experience there just briefly? If you'd rather not, that's okay too. Um, in relation to the sitting? Yeah, and just the the importance of- <laughs> Yeah, oh, uh, absolutely, yeah, 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 I'd be happy to. Because it, what, I, what I'm relating it to is, is the eye making that would yeah. otherwise uh, interrupt this. I don't know why that's there. <laughs> sure. Not interrupt it. Um, it. Provide ongoing distraction from wanting it to be something that fits our views rather than something that the Buddha actually taught. Yeah. Um, I think what John was referring to, I was. Um, invited to teach Qigong at a, um, a space uh, last night and it was for a friend. So I said, yeah, sure, no problem. Um, and the beginning of the um, beginning of the, the class, they do a Buddhist service um, that included some chanting, some reading some books, and um, different things, including a sit. You sit for 20 minutes, and then you could get up and, and walk or stretch, and then come back and sit again for 20 minutes. Um, and and then I went and taught my class, and it was, and it was, it was great. Um, but what I, what I talked to John about is that really how grateful I am for him and for you guys, the Sangha, because nobody there was really learning Buddhism. They weren't learning anything, really. They were doing some things. They weren't really learning anything. And what has been established here is actually authentic. And it's very important, very important to, in my opinion, to, to um, encounter and become involved in authentic practices. Um, so there's a lot of things that are that were that were done there and, and sort of motions that were gone through and things like that that brought no insight into what it is to be here. In I a, ask you, did you, did you find it distracting even from what otherwise yeah, might be I taking place? It, it was it was like a pleasant distraction. Mm. Right? It wasn't, what was the teaching? Was, there was no teaching. No. There was no teaching. There was more ritual. In, in yeah. fact, not more, right? It was ritual rather than Studying what they're studying and integrating. Yeah, there was there was no no sutras. There was just um, just recitation of of snippets of things and an overall feeling that was cultivated. Um, nothing nothing bad. It was nothing. Mm -hmm. Nothing scary. <laughs> Just like, <coughs> nothing real. And I'm not, I don't mean this to be harsh or anything because that, that's not 
That's not my intent. But this is real. This is this actually what what the Buddha taught was medicine for humanity and hmm. how to recognize and abandon craving and clinging. And that wasn't what that that wasn't what that was about. And so it, it, you can go all around and I and I have gone all around. And I've been in lots of different groups and sits and talks and all kinds of stuff. And it was it's really to to investigate the Dhamma in this way is incredibly valuable and holds in it a path to awaken. So that's something that's that's still here for humanity after 2600 years. And Probably gonna have to watch. Yeah, because you know, <laughs> it's, it's still it, it was recorded in a way and preserved in a way and passed, continued, practiced in a way that it's still here. It's still here, and, and it's it's really what a treasure! It's a treasure. It's, it's just a real treasure. And when we get into the sutta and we see that. What we really are as human beings, aside from what we think we are and what we, the ideas that we have, but actually what we are as biological entities on this planet Earth, um, you know. It blows my mind. It really, it just, it just really blows my mind the the depth and of insight that the Buddha had into what it means to be a human being here on planet Earth. Um, we're fortunate enough to have John to um, have mined this information for us and present it to us in a way that is consistent with how it was presented 2,600 years ago. And that's, it's not easy. It requires a lot of effort. Um, it's a very compassionate act. It's a very compassionate gesture. Um, this is what I was getting at. This is what I was getting at. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Matt. The, uh, you'll see how this ties in, but the, the, the Buddha was only concerned, I'm only concerned, we're only concerned with getting an understanding of what it is to be a human being and not be distracted by anything else that would take us out of our body and out of that direct path. Um, the, the venue that Matt was at, I, I went quite often many years ago and I always left, uh, it was an experience of dukkha, I always left disappointed because I couldn't understand what they were doing. And it, it's, it's called, Blah, 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 a Buddhist center. Um, but it seemed like everything but, and I didn't even know what the Buddha was really teaching at that point, but it seemed like everything but what an awakened human being would taught, would teach, was presented there. And it gave me insight into what I was looking for, which is what we've established here. And, and again, to make that point, that that is the reason why we stay so well focused, because I understand, that much like the Buddha search in the Arya Pariyasana Sutta, I understand he understood how easy it is to pick up distractions and call them so-called spiritual practice. And so it gets right down to this very bare bones and basic sutta that I'll get to in a minute. Um, so I want to uh, put this directly in a context of dependent origination. Dependent origination, the 12 links of dependent, dependent origination state that from ignorance, <clears throat> very specific ignorance, ignorance of four noble truths leads to fabrications. And we went through that, the, the Palasa Sutta and other suttas. A fabrication is something that is rooted in ignorance 
And it's a way of seeing the world that is fabricated, it's perver perverted, it's distorted because of ignorance. And think about you know, just that, that little connection there. If you're ignorant of anything, your conclusions can only be fabricated, correct? From ignorance of Four Noble Truths comes fabrication. From fabrications comes consciousness. Now, again, it's not a grand cosmic consciousness. It's not unity consciousness. It, it has nothing to do with all of our minds are interdependent or interconnected or interbe. In the context that the Buddha teaches this, the consciousness is simply ongoing thinking, being informed from fabricated views rooted in ignorance. From ignorance comes fabrications, comes consciousness. From that type of consciousness, that ongoing thinking rooted in ignorance of Four Noble Truths comes name and form. The Pali word or, or phrase is Nama Rupa, which means name and form. It simply means that we've identified ourselves as this form. I've given it a name. It's me. It's mine. It's myself. This is what I am. And again, that's a common theme too throughout the Buddha's teaching to remind yourself when you're self-identifying to remember that it's a fabricated view. This is not me. This is not mine. This is not myself. From name and form as a requisite condition comes the sixth sense base. I almost forgot it. Our five physical senses, senses moderated by that, that consciousness. But remember, it's consciousness rooted in ignorance of four noble truths. So now I've, I've identified myself with external and internal phenomena. And as I'm coming in contact and interpreting that phenomena, I'm interpreting it from what? From what point of view? Ignorance. A fabricated view rooted in ignorance. Notice the progression. Uh, dependent origination, and it's often given the name dependent co-arising, and then dependence is, the word dependent is often dropped or simply not mentioned, and it's interdependent co-arising or interconnected or interbeing. Interdependent and dependent are two different words. They, they have two completely different meanings, and yet most of modern Buddhism has no trouble substituting interdependent, interconnected, or interbeing and calling it interdependent co-arising and creating a creation myth of how all the worlds came into being and how we came into being within this cosmic um, soup. And notice there's nothing here about, a, about, a, about whether individual creation or the creation of the universe. The Buddha is simply describing how we end up from ignorance into a human experience prone to confusion, deluded thinking and suffering. So from the sixth sense space comes contact. Makes sense, doesn't it? And also notice that this is this sequence is not linear. It's not within linear time so much as it, it as it happens. You could say it's outside of time, or it happens in an instant. It's not something that we can put a timeline on, but as we develop concentration, we can recognize each step along the way. Uh, from contact comes feeling makes sense doesn't it from feeling as a requisite condition comes craving i come in contact with something i like it or don't like the other side of craving is aversion i like it or i don't like it that's it feeling in that sense from craving as a requisite condition i remember that craving now is rooted in self-identification or self-reference i'm now using whatever that feeling gave rise to within namarupa within self-identification to describe me I like this, I don't like that. And on and on and on it goes. So, and remember, all of that is rooted in ignorance of Four Noble Truths. From craving as a requisite condition comes clinging and maintaining. I've created a self, I decided what the self needs to be happy, what it needs to avoid to maintain happiness or security. And I cling to that because that's who I think I am. I have no other reference except a reference rooted in ignorance. And because of that clinging, I'm maintaining now something that is itself fabricated and as we'll learn very quickly is prone to ongoing suffering. From clinging and maintaining comes becoming. Remember the, the, the context, becoming what? There's no modifier here or any other teaching this way because it doesn't need a modifier when we understand the context. From clinging and maintaining comes becoming further ignorant. And I wanna just give a break there and mention this is from the Loka Sutta because it relates directly to what we're talking about. Becoming anything other than self, the world, the people in the world, clings to becoming because it's all that we know. Becoming anything other than self, 
remember we have we have created this self that is anything other than what a true person is as we'll find find out quickly enough to become afflicted by becoming and yet delights in that very becoming why would we delight in it because we don't know anything else of course we're going to delight and we're going to justify our delight in fact we're often taught that we should delight in this fabrication that we've called ourselves there's something wrong and not delighting in it where there is the buddha teaches where there is delight there's fear why because we're holding this together we know ultimately we're holding it together with nothing it's not rooted in anything where there is delight there's fear where there is fear there's stress the life integrated with the eightfold path is lived for the abandoning of becoming further ignorant it's the whole purpose the life integrated with the eightfold path is lived for the abandoning of becoming those that say that escape from becoming is by non-becoming are never released from becoming i declare the buddha says again we talked about this before what does it mean by non-becoming it's any establishment of yourself in an imaginary fabricated non-physical realm and it could be the classic such as the, the the dimension of infinite consciousness or infinite space or the dimension of neither perception nor non-perception or it could be the dimension that i'm the world's greatest baker or the world's greatest meditation teacher or the world's greatest meditator or the world's greatest anything or the world's poorest and underlying all of that that's all part of non-becoming because it's why because it's rooted in a fabrication ultimately if i understand who i am it doesn't matter if i'm the world's greatest baker it's that i'm the, the world that, that i'm a mindful baker right. right you see the difference mm -hmm. i know you do <laughs> also, John, yes is it only because it's based on the eightfold path that awakening isn't a similar type of That's paradox yes yes what a what a great question so please because non-becoming is a desire that without the proper setting of the eightfold path and a practice based on the Four Noble Truth, awakening could be an equally <coughs> disappointing yeah. and distracting and distracting goal. And yes. Becoming is a similar type of concept. Yes, thank you so much. That's so important and it relates to just what Matt, that's why I asked Matt to talk about that. And again, it's not, we didn't mention the center, so we're not putting down those people or that place, but that's exactly what happens. And whether it happens within a Buddhist practice or any type of ideological fantasized way of where we should go, is just that. And the Buddha's brilliance was that he recognized that unless we had a, a framework for recognizing that we're doing that, we would simply create endless planes of non-becoming to establish ourselves in, to avoid the, the fear that's rooted in, the, in that initial delight of becoming other than self. So it really is just actually coming, understanding the ordinariness of it. Yeah. That it's not anything special. It's, yeah. it's, it's not easy to grasp those concepts and to really become that practice, but it really is just living an ordinary life. That each moment is just simply ordinary. It's not attached to that distraction. Yes, no matter how extraordinary the moment might be. Mm -hmm. And why? Because what is experiencing that is completely ordinary. And that might not be good enough. For most them. it's not that it's only for those as the buddha said it's only and this was his this was his uh conundrum when he awakened because he understood the ordinariness he understood the unattractiveness of this because it flies in the face of the specialness of of ongoing eye making mm -hmm. of becoming anything other than self as he's as he describes in this sutta and so it's it's not nearly enough for most people that are rooted in uh, just, just to use these words, an arrogant ego-centered self, which is what anatta is. You know, those are rather unpleasant when you have words. Those when Pardon you, me. When you have those experiences, when you, where you can see the, the what's in front of you, what, what life 
it's in front of you, uh, <clears throat> it is by no means boring. For, no. For, uh, then each, <clears throat> each and every moment, when we take the ordinariness out of ourselves, when we, when we take the extraordinariness out of ourselves, mm -hmm. then each and every moment is extraordinary. When we have it, we have it mixed up. We insist that I'm so special mm -hmm. that nothing is good enough for me, literally. And, and they're very disappointing. Always, no matter how wonderful something happens. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to continue to crave. <laughs> and even, but now, but now let's bring it back to why, why even something as extraordinary as an awakened human being's teaching isn't good enough. There's not enough there. And so we need to adapt it, accommodate it, and embellish it in some way. To do what? to satisfy eye making, which is exactly what the Buddha is getting to, what David was bringing up, what we're all seeing here. It's just remarkable. And again, you heard me say it over and over again, true mindfulness means to be mindful of life as life occurs, and then each and every moment is meaningful. Why? Because I'm not in it anymore. I'm not judging it. I'm not putting a value on it, whether I like it or I don't like it. I'm simply in it. Let me continue. Point, oh, please. On one little thing. Um, <clears throat> that sentence, anything or that part of the sentence, anything other than self, that's part negates this whole idea that, that the Buddha said there is no self. Ex oh, exactly. He's still he never said you, that there's no you, such you, thing. You're he's, going other he said, than self. He said the problem is that you think, <clears throat> you think, he said, you you, in essence, becoming anything other than self is establishing yourself as nothing mm -hmm. because it's a, it's a fabrication. It's an imagination. He's saying a self is these six elements. There's nothing extraordinary about it, but it's the truth. That's what a person is. That's what he's describing to Upasaki. I don't remember his name. And when I get to it, you'll see that. That's, a, that's, that's why this is such a basic and important sutta because it's, it's really describing everything. And that's, I'm still in the Loka Sutta, so we'll see. This might be a five-part. <laughs> <laughs> those, <miss> <laughs> <the, laughs> those that say that escape from becoming is by not becoming or never released from becoming, I declare. Stress or dukkha arises in dependence on becoming self, on self-identification or self-establishment. With the ending of clinging to self and maintaining self, no stress will arise. How does the Buddha describe an, a, an awakened human being's mind? Calm. There's no stress because you're not trying to create a self out of nothing. Look at the world. Human beings afflicted with ignorance crave for and cling to becoming. That's pretty obvious to all of us now, isn't it? I would bet that two years ago, if I said that one sentence, most of you would say, huh? Right? Because you really don't know how to apply it. What do you mean we're clinging to becoming? But now you understand it because you see the context. All forms of becoming anywhere in any way are impermanent, stressful, and always subject to, to change. Knowing this, the arising and the passing away from right view, craving for becoming and non-becoming is abandoned. Okay, that's enough. Well, we, from the abandonment of craving for becoming and non-becoming comes unbinding from those wrong views rooted in ignorance of Four Noble Truths. For those unbound from lack of clinging and maintaining, there is no further becoming, further ignorance. Cessation. Cessation. They have conquered ignorance, and so notice the importance of these two lines. They have conquered ignorance. They have completed the task. What is a task? Conquering ignorance. Why would we, why, if we're going to follow an awake human being's teaching, why would we want to do anything else but conquer ignorance? And they have gone beyond becoming a self-rooted ignorance. That's the, as far as I'm going to go with the locus sutta. Now to fit, the finished dependent origination from clinging and maintaining comes becoming further ignorant. From becoming further ignorant comes birth. Notice the, the, the sequencing here. The Buddha is not talking about, well, from ignorance, now I'm, I have a physical body and I'm in a nine-month gestation period. No, He's not birth, talking about that. Birth is I am. I am this. Yes. Giving birth to, to wrong views rooted in ignorance, to self-identification. That's birth as far as the Buddha is concerned. And it's so important to understand that because it relates to karma and rebirth. And what is the Buddha teaching? I'm not going to teach that later, but. That's exactly it. It's the birth of I am, the birth of me, but the birth of me in such a way that I'm that I'm that that me is rooted in a fabricated, perverted, distorted view of reality. So what's going to happen to me? I'm going to suffer. In fact, no matter what wonderful life I might create for myself, 
I'm going to suffer unless I figure out a way or I'm shown a way to understand what I've just done to myself. The Buddha concludes that 12 link uh, sequence and from birth as a requisite condition, from the birth of me as a requisite condition comes, I won't go through the whole list, comes all manner of confusion, deluded thinking and ongoing suffering. From ignorance, suffering arises. So I think I've laid the context now for the sutta, <laughs> if I can find it. Where is it? There it is. Okay. So, I think I'm going to, I'm going to go over the, or skip the, my whole introduction because that was a better one anyway. Um, the Datu Vibhanga Sutta, the analysis of the properties. On one occasion, the Buddha was wandering on, among the Magadans. He entered Rajagaha and went to the potter Bhagava. He asked Bhagava, is, if it is no inconvenient for you, friend, I will stay for one night in your shed. It is no inconvenience for me, but the long wanderer Pukasati has already taken up residence there. <clears throat> if he gives his permission, you may stay there as you like. Pukasati, a fellow Sakyan, the Buddha, the Buddha was of the Sakyan clan, had gone forth into homelessness and was developing the Buddha's Dhamma. The Buddha approached Pukasati and asked him if he could stay one night in his shed. Pukasati replied, the shed is roomy, my friend, stay as you like. The Buddha entered the shed and sat on a pile of leaves and grass. Folding his legs crosswise and holding his body erect, erect he set mindfulness to the floor and began jhana, began to meditate. Pukasati joined him in meditation for most of the evening. As morning approached, the Buddha had the thought, how inspiring Pukasati behaves. Let me question him as a, on his understanding. And I love this part. You just see the, you know, the, the irreverence that the Buddha has even for himself in this setting. He's not going to tell Pukasati who he is, but he's just going to give him a Dhamma teaching. Venerable Pukasati, out of dedication, to whom have you gone forth? Who is your teacher and whose Dhamma are you practicing? My teacher is Gotama, the contemplative, the Sakyan son. He is known far and wide as a Buddha, a rightly self-awakened one, who is consummate in clear knowing and of pure conduct. He is an expert of worldly affairs and the unsurpassed teacher of those fit to be taught. I have gone forth with dedication to him as my teacher and as his Dhamma that I am practicing. Friend Pukasati, where is the Buddha staying now? Wanderer, I have heard that the Buddha is in Savati, which is about, you know, I don't know that geography all that well, but I think it's about 60 miles from where the Buddha is staying. Have you met the Buddha and would you recognize him? No, I, I have never met the Buddha and I would not recognize him. From that brief conversation, the Buddha understood Pukasati's devotion. Without identifying himself, he said to Pukasati, I will teach you the Dhamma, friend. Listen and pay close attention as I speak. A person has six properties. It's a definitive statement, isn't it? A person has six properties. That's what we are. They have six media of sensory contact, the sixth sense base, leading from that, the six properties in that sixth sense base that leads to 18 distinct considerations. Furthermore, a well-focused Dhamma practitioner establishes four wise determinations, a well-focused Dhamma practitioner, he's not saying just anyone. Through those 18 considerations, a wise pra practitioner has, de has develops these four wise determinations. The Buddha continues, having established these four wise determinations, this one has still the distraction of fabricated speculation and supposition. When the distraction of fabricated speculation and supposition has still, this one is said to be a sage of peace with speculation and supposition of continued self-establishment rooted in those fabrications. And that's addressed at, towards the end of the sutta, if you remember from last week. A well-focused Dharma practitioner should not neglect wise discernment, should always guard the truth, should always be devoted to unbinding, and should always train the, main, the mind only for calm. Again, the Buddha is teaching to be very austere with your Dhamma practice, and if you're going to meditate, you meditate only for calm. This is my summary of the analysis of these six properties that constitute a person. The earth property, 
the liquid property, the fire property, the wind property, the space property and the consciousness property. So if anybody asks you, what does the Buddha teach as a self, as a person, you say, look, this is what the Buddha teaches, these four basic elements and these other two elements. That's a person. And you can't dispute that. That's what we are. And it's, and it's completely ordinary. And it's also the profound teachings of an awakened human being. This is a person. And this person has these six, pro the Buddha concludes, I was saying, a person has these six properties. Furthermore, a person has six media of sensory contact, the sixth sense base. The eye, the ear, the nose, the tongue, the body, the intellect, consciousness, root, and ignorance. A person has these six media of sensory conduct. Furthermore, a person has 18 considerations. So these are, this person now described from six properties having the sixth sense base, from that has only these 18 considerations. Upon contact. Uh, uh, upon contact. On seeing form with the eye, one considers form as a basis for pleasure, or form as a basis for disappointment, or form as a basis for equanimity. You could say that there's really, there's two considerations, if you want to boil it down. The one consideration is a consideration for distraction and further ignorance. The other consideration is considering the form as a basis for developing awakening. And how do we do that? How do we, de how do we, how do we determine what the, what our determination is going to be? The yes, by integrating the Eightfold Path and recognizing that if there is pleasure or pain associated with the contact, it's because of self-reference, it's self-identifying with it. The Buddha con consistently described the problem with suffering as we join with our suffering. And here he's describing it in a little bit more detail. Or we can recognize Excuse me. That on contacting form with the eye, this is a basis for developing equanimity, for understanding. How? By seeing it clearly, by seeing it without any self reference. Think about that. Can you do it? Can you look on a, on a, on a form, on a beautiful flower, and not identify with it? Can you? <laughs> yes. You can. It's possible to not. I think it's possible. That's again, the third noble truth says cessation of suffering is possible. And how is it possible? Through the fourth noble truth, the Eightfold Path. Thank you for saying that. On hearing sound with the ear, one considers sound as a basis for pleasure, or sound as a basis for disappointment, or sound as a basis for equanimity. You were teaching, and the, a word became almost a request by many in Sangha about uh, the neutral. I forget the exact word. Mm -hmm. So equanimity mm -hmm. seems to be neither pleasure nor pain. But at the time, the, the, there was a lot of uh, questions about the neutrality of of that uh, third choice: not pleasure, not pain. Yeah. And I just find it interesting that this okay, equanimity, which is the, the uh, seventh factor, yeah, it's just interesting. Yeah. yeah. And and it, it's within. I don't want to get too far off, but this this is important, David. That that ambiguous state of neither pleasure nor pain is often felt as boredom to an ordinary human being, and we don't want it. But most of our life, excuse me, is in that ambiguous boredom state, that something doesn't have our attention. And we don't like that. We, we often get agitated when we're not distracted by something. But that's the underlying state for all human beings. And that state itself, from an awakened point of view, is a mind resting in equanimity. The, the correlation to meditation is really striking here. The difficulty that most of us have with meditation, particularly beginning meditators, is it's just too damn boring. We need something right now. I can't just sit here. I need something to distract my mind. But if I can develop equanimity, it's the same state, isn't it? Lacking the need to be free of boredom. Well, it, 
it's not if it's if it's equanimity, then there's no self identification. There's no self, and so there's no there. There can be no boredom. There can be no distraction or need for distraction. Be, why? Because I'm not looking to continue to establish myself in my thoughts, which is ultimately where we're going with this: right view, wrong view; right thinking, wrong thinking. Because who is experiencing pleasure or pain? If it's equanimity, there's no one. There's there's no me there's, there. There's just these six properties. Yeah. And is there anything within this property that can feel that? And I'm not talking about you get whacked over the head. Is there anything in the six properties that can have that that type of thought induced pain? There isn't. It's just six six properties. Great questions and, and commentary here, or discussion on smelling an aroma with the nose. One considers aroma as a basis for pleasure or aroma as a basis for disappointment or aroma as a basis for equanimity. On tasting flavor, et cetera, et cetera. On, let me, uh, I'm going to skip over that one, but do this one. On feeling a tactile sensation with the body, one considers feeling as a basis for pleasure or feeling as a basis for disappointment or feeling as a basis for equanimity. The reason why I, I skipped over one and, and read that one is that this is one of the primary distractions, isn't it? Physical pleasure. And we don't lose physical pleasure Let me just read the, on feeling a tactile sensation with the body, one considers feeling as a basis for pleasure, as a basis for disappointment, or as a basis for equanimity. So no matter how wonderfully distracting pleasure might be, if we remove the self-identification with it, it's a basis for equanimity. Pretty profound, isn't it? Taking us all the way there. There's something that we feel like we're entitled to and, and should be an aspect of my life is feeling providing pleasure for me is now an opportunity or a, or a, a, a determination for equanimity. And so is uh, the feeling of pain or discomfort. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, I just went through a cold and um, frankly, it wasn't a big deal. And it was mostly because I could keep my mind on the fact that this was just what was happening. And yeah. <clears throat> even though, yeah, my nose was running and my head was about to explode and all that, um, it was all pretty much on track. And I knew how it was going to go. And um, that was pretty much it. And it just took the, um, <clears throat> and, yeah, I, I somehow managed to, to um, go through it in, in, with some measure of equanimity. Because he didn't take it personal. It's I, passionate. Yeah. It was just happening. This, yeah, is, what, this is what's going on with the form. The whole came by, you know, I happened to be in the way, and then there we are. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the next uh, property, on cognizing an idea with the intellect, one considers the idea as a basis for pleasure or basis for disappointment or the idea as a basis for equanimity. As opposed to someone who's not framing their thinking by the Eightfold Path, in which case every thought is a self-referential thought. And the reason why we continue down this road is because we attach to our thoughts because they're who we use to define ourselves. We have a thought, it's a valid thought simply because I have it. A person who understands what the Buddha is teaching understands that any thought then is a basis for developing equanimity when we remove self-reference from the thought. These are the six considerations that are conducive to pleasure, six considerations that are conducive to disappointment, and six considerations that are conducive to equanimity. A person has these 18 considerations. So what, as Dharma practitioners, what considerations do we want to have when something contacts our senses? is use that, again, that's, that's the teaching. And we talked about this when we went through the series on the wisdom of restraint. It's at contact, at the sixth sense space, that our opportunity to develop awakening exists, to, to move the mind towards equanimity, or to react through grasping, clinging, aversion, or even confusion, and continue ignorance. It, it's right there. It's right in our face. It's right at these six properties. Does everybody see that and see that in the context of this sutta? 
And so when you understand these six properties are nothing special, there's no, there's no, even no me in them. But within those properties is the opportunity for me to develop awakening. To really understand what a person is and what a person isn't. Let me go back just a little bit. These are the six considerations that are con conducive to pleasure, the six considerations that are conducive to disappointment, and the six considerations that are conducive to equanimity. A person has these 18 considerations. Furthermore, a wise Dhamma practitioner has four determinations. This is what we're practicing for. The determination for discernment or understanding or wisdom. The determination for truth or noble truths. The determination for relinquishment. Relinquishment of what? Relinquishment of ignorance or wrong views rooted in ignorance. Remember, the context gives us the answers. The determination for calm. That's why we're doing this. I'm determined to develop a calm and peaceful mind. How do I do it? Well, an awakened human being told me that I can do it through an eightfold path. By understanding myself, and by the way, this teaching is also a very profound, profound teaching, not only on anatta, but all three marks of existence. You can see it all in here. A wise Dhamma practitioner has these four determinations. A Dhamma practitioner should not neglect discernment, should guard the truth. They should be devoted to relinquishment and train only for calm. Talk about it. If you're wondering, if your Dhamma practic practice seems like it's a little unfocused, just remember that. This is what we do. A Dhamma practitioner should not neglect discernment. We should guard the truth. We should be devoted to relinquishment and we should train only for common. I think we, we do that pretty well here. And how does one not neglect discernment? Through mindfulness of the six properties. And what is the earth property? The earth property can be internal or external. The internal earth property is anything within oneself that is hard, solid, and sustained by craving. Head, hair, body, nails, teeth, skin, flesh, tendons, bones, marrow, kidneys, heart, liver, membranes, spleen, lungs, intestines, contents of the stomach, feces, and anything else internal within oneself that's hard, solid, and sustained by craving. This is called the internal earth property. This is an important line. Both internal earth property and external earth property are simply earth property. Why does the Buddha say that? Remember the, the teachings on becoming and non-becoming. The external earth property is the thought of a self established in some other realm rather than right here. A non-becoming self, a self established in a non-physical existence, whether it might be some future life. If I do all things right, I get this great gift of Buddhist heaven. It might be in the establishment of infinite space or infinite consciousness, et cetera, et cetera. That's all external earth property, isn't it? It might be as becoming the world's greatest baker. So I can show all those lower bakers out there. That's external. The Buddha's teaching that even that confused and deluded view is part is just internal earth property. It's just part of these six properties. Saying in a very emphatic way, there's nothing special about any of that. No, a Buddha did use this word in translation. It's not any of that nonsense either. It's all just this earth property. And that brings that mystical and magical and fantastical thinking that was even prevalent during the Buddha's time back to you're just this. You're just these six properties. No matter how hard you want to imagine yourself not, no matter how much you want to non-become something other than self, you're just these, you're just made up of these six properties. Is that clear? Yes. So the external part is just <clears throat> whatever we want to strive for in our deluded state. Yes. <clears throat> the internal and external earth property are just the earth property. I think I said before that the internal and external earth property are just the internal. It's not the internal earth property. It's just the earth property. That's all there is. Mm -hmm. So we can imagine ourselves out of that as much as we want, mind out of the body now, the Buddha taught to unite the mind and the body. We can engage in practices that, that reinforce that view. We can gain, 
the progression too of the Upada Sutta a couple weeks ago is the reason why I taught that first before this. We can associate with thoughts, views, ideas, or people that take us out of our bodies, take our minds out of our bodies. This external, take this internal property, make it an external property, and because of maybe common agreement or it feels good, okay, I'll establish myself there. As Buddha says, no matter how hard you try, no matter how much imagination you might have, it's just earth property. Clear? Important too. And again, what we're, <coughs> This, this teaching is getting, the reason why it's getting to the heart of the matter is it's, it's, it's such a clear and basic teaching on bringing the mind here where it is in these six properties and nowhere else. Okay. Um, I'm gonna skip over some of my commentary. Um, This is how the earth property should be seen by one with right discernment. Anybody know the answer to this besides Matt? You can answer if you want to. How should we see the earth property with wise discernment? Just this earth property. Or you. This is not me. This is not mine. This yeah. is not myself. Yeah, and how many other sutras have we heard that in? Yeah. <laughs> so when we are when we find our, and this is a really a simple exercise. Um, I'll give it to you all for homework. When you find yourself identifying with your form, with the earth property, just remind yourself, this is not me, this is not mine, this is not who I am, this is not myself. And I think you'll experience some great freedom. You might also f experience, the deeper you take this, um, a little bit of a loss of equilibrium because you're going from a view that establishes yourself outside of your body and now you're no longer there and you're bringing it back into your body. The, con the, the, the paradox is interesting too. When you stop identifying yourself with form, you can now bring yourself into that form. Mm -hmm. But this is not me. This is not mine. This is not myself. And we've talked about this at other times. When you find yourself reacting through contact to anything, to remind yourself, this is not me. This is not myself. That, that's, that's, the, that's a teaching that is that the Buddha, that, that is still prevalent here, it's still relevant, isn't it? That the Buddha first gave 2,600 years ago. And yet, like Pukasati, we can use that teaching directly from the Buddha to awaken. Isn't that remarkable? And I think it is. Matt used it, blows my mind. That, that blows my mind away. And it's such a useful and direct teaching that we can do, and I can do anytime I find myself outside of my body by reacting to or attaching myself to something that is not me because it's just ordinary property. So let me read it. This is how the earth property should be seen by one with right discernment. This is not me. This is not mine. This is not what I am. This is not myself. When one sees this as it has come to be with right discernment, one becomes disenchanted with the earth property. And that's a good word to use. Enchanted means we're we're mesmerized, almost self-hypnotized by my connection to this form. It's not a bad thing to become disenchanted, that we start seeing things clearly when we are disenchanted. Through disenchanted with the earth property and through lack of sustenance, the earth property fades from mind. By simply stopping feeding the ego, to use a modern term, the earth property fades from the self-identification. Of course, as self-identification with the earth property fades from mind, doesn't mean that we no longer have a body. It simply means we're not self-identifying with something that is utterly ordinary and not worth self-identifying with. Um, I think this whole, I'm, I'm trying to decide if, I should, if that's a good place to stop. Well, I went a little further on Saturday, but Um, let me do it this way, because you've all read it. And so the Buddha goes through that same sequence in each property. Uh, liquid, fire, wind, space. This is not me. This is not mine. This is not myself. Um, and the, 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 the little bit of, con of confusion might be the space property. Usually we're talk we talk about the four elements, and the Buddha's talking here about six elements, but the, it's because of his brilliance. Without the space property, there's nothing else. 
In other words, and he relates it not to the, the space between the planets, because, okay, that, that's true. He talks about the space in the mouth. If there wasn't a space in the mouth, there'd be no mouth. There'd be there'd nothing to define the hole for air in, in, a, in, a, in a completely practical way, for food to go in. If there wasn't a, a negative space. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's, it's important to understand that that is part of us. And then that, that interpretive part of consciousness. So let me just read that. And then. That's funny. Yeah. Like, he thinks about your nostrils. Yeah. <laughs> and, and he talks about it. Nostrils are part of the space mm -hmm. property, right? If, if, you didn't, if you didn't have the space, you couldn't breathe. If you didn't have the ear canal, if you didn't well, have an. Think about it. That's the key. The most yeah, the shape of part space. is the empty space. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. And. and you know, when you when you draw something, you're thinking about your positive and negative space and the shape that exists within whatever it is that you're looking to draw. So you can think about things on that kind of micro level, you know, when you're drawing something and learning mm. about that shape. But I never stop to think about the the negative space within the body too. Yeah. And and so in that way you're really when you're drawing something you're really defining space aren't you yeah well, and yeah. negative space between your your thoughts oh yeah mm -hmm. in, in fact in your yeah and as oh, i think all of us have related to the idea of as we deepen our meditation practice, our concentration practice it feels like our, our thoughts are just more spacious and it really is true because we don't we're not so compulsively attaching one thought to the next thought to the next thought. Our minds are calming down and developing equanimity. And so, yeah, there's, there's space there, even within it. So what a great relationship we just discovered here, the six properties, including space and how they relate to the seven properties and how they relate to that eight, or, no, the five properties, how they relate to the six of consciousness. And consciousness itself requires space. I'm not going to sleep tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and well, maybe, I mean, maybe I'll put you to sleep with the rest of this. <laughs> um, just a little bit more. In concluding this section, and what is the consciousness property? Consciousness, free of fabrication, remains pure and bright. Notice how the Buddha starts this off. Free of fabrication is pure and bright. Now he gets into what are the problems here. What is perceived by consciousness? One perceives pleasure, one perceives pain, or one perceives neither pleasure nor pain. It's one of those three things. In dependence on sensory contact that is to be felt as pleasure, there arises a feeling of pleasure. Look at the, the line here. In dependence on sensory contact that is to be felt as pleasure. There's all, the, the Buddha is teaching us that there's already a inherent grasping here. I'm grasping after this so I can feel pleasure. That is to be felt as pleasure. There arise as a feeling of pleasure. It's following my intention. The second factor of the Eightfold Path. Which is the confirmation bias. Confirmation bias. It's something I don't want to get into, but they, they, they define that even a little bit more narrowly than I came across now. Nah, I don't want to get into it. Um, but I will, because it's interesting. <laughs> Stay tuned. Stay tuned, yeah. <laughs> in dependence on sensory contact that is to be felt as pain, this relates to aversion, doesn't it? Uh-oh, this is not going to be good. In dependence on sensory contact that is, that is to be felt as pain, there arises a feeling of pain. It's not something arbitrary or chaotic, is it? It has to do with the conditioned mind that we have and our presupposition rooted in confirmation bias. <clears throat> Due to self-identification, one perceives I am sensing a feeling of pain. It's not because of, it's not it's not because of the arbitrariness of the occurrence. It's because of their predisposition to the self-identification. In dependence on sensory contact that is to be felt as neither pleasure nor pain, there arises a feeling of neither pleasure nor pain. Due to self-identification, one perceives I am sensing neither pleasure nor pain. Usually, if that's a, a, a feeling of boredom. The Buddha continues, through refined mindfulness, 
one understands that with a cessation of self-identification, that very sensory contact, of that very sensory contact, the feeling of pleasure has arisen independently of that contact. It's arisen independently. There's nothing attached to it. What is to be felt as pleasure ceases. It is still. So the experience still occurs, but it hasn't led to a disturbance in the mind. Even if it's pain? Mm -hmm. You asked the question. <laughs> Through refined mindfulness and passing away of, well, I'm sorry. Through refined mindfulness, one understands that with the cessation of self-identification of that very sensory contact, the feeling of pain has arisen independently of that contact. What is to be felt as pain ceases. It is still. What is to be felt? So it doesn't mean that the, the physical experience, if you break your leg and you're awakened, you're going to notice that you broke your leg for obvious reasons. So you don't walk on it. That's really the reason why we have pain. So we know that there's something wrong to be attended to. But we won't react to it from a, from a self-identifying -identify, self-referential view. It won't create the disturbance in my mind as, oh, this dark cloud is always upon me. And now why I broke my leg. Why did this happen to me? How come I stepped into the hole? Why was I walking here and they weren't? You know, et cetera, et cetera. Just that's, that's the reason. There's no self-identification. There's no second arrow. It's simply what's occurred. And so in that way, it's not to say that breaking your leg is going to be a pleasurable experience, but it will be meaningful because at least you're not distracted and taking it personally. Or a completely dull experience, but just... Well, I would, yeah. And, and I would say the meaningfulness in that situation would be to calmly address what needs to be addressed. That's meaningful. And I think we've all experienced that. We've attended to a situation mindfully, knowing that it was simply the... the the skillful way to do it. There's great meaning in that. Let me go just a little further and we'll call it a night. So saying ow is completely appropriate. <laughs> oh, yeah. When you yeah. hurt yourself. And saying grrr when you're angry, that's, yeah. that's, it's animal stuff. This and, is, this is uh, like, yes, and if you have developed earth modern earth. mindfulness to the point where you're not able to face that, you won't say ow. Because you'll think that's what you're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. yeah, Say that again? Much of modern, uh, much of modern mindfulness takes us out of our body and away from feeling, even though it's designed to do just the opposite. In other words, right. you would have so such control of your mind that you're. Be In fact, there's some teachers that teach. Well, I'm gonna stick a nail through my hand. I won't feel any pain. It's possible to do that through a severe level of mind control, laying on a bed of nails. That's not an awakened or even a, a, a higher type of consciousness. That's just a manipulated way of using your mind. So an awakened human being will break their leg or step on a nail and say, ow, and they'll move off of it. It's like that question that our, our friend asked me on our first retreat, and I was getting into the not self characteristic, et cetera. And he asked this question because he was, he was stuck in this, there's no such thing as a self view. He says, what happens if you're standing on a train track and a train is coming at you? Like, Somebody who is awakened would just stand there because there's nothing to get hurt. Well, it's ridiculous, isn't it? Oh, an awakened, fully mature Buddha would take two steps to the right and let the pain train gracefully pass. But if the train hit them, they'd feel it. They'd say how. Yeah, they might probably. That might be. That might be beyond them now. They, they, they're, yeah, they're, they're done with ignorance at that point. Through through. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Without, without the understanding the difference between approval and acceptance. I don't need to approve of it because there's nothing here to approve. I accept it because it's what's occurring. And it's occurring to these six properties that everyone has. Through refined mindfulness, one understands that with a cessation of self-identification of that very sensory contact, the feeling of neither pleasure nor pain has arisen independently of that contact. What is to be felt as neither pleasure nor pain ceases. It's still. Uh, I'm going to stop there, I think. That's enough for tonight, isn't it? In the sense that it does not continue. Yes, it's just... I, I, let, me, let me do this. Try to set a bookmark. Okay. Um, as he said to Bahia and many others, in what is seen, there is only the seen. Mm -hmm. In what is heard, there is only the heard. In what is cognized, there is only the cognized. 
for when there is no you here, there, or anyone else, not, not using Buddha's words, but Buddha is implying, then you are known as an awakened one. When there's no you here, there, or anywhere else. But what is here, there, and anyone else, everywhere else then? These six properties. Just as the Buddha example during his entire life. He lived the last 45 years of his life as these six properties. With an incredibly brilliant, effective mind leading, living probably the most meaningful life anybody ever lived without the need for self-identification. Such a profound teaching. So that's tonight's, uh, thank you. Um, let's, uh, let's ask uh, uh, Kevin or Jane, do you have any questions or comments? Why don't you start Jane, ladies first. Oh, I might need to. I have to unmute. Hi, John. No. Yeah, good, you did it. How are you, Jane? I'm joyful and calm. How are you, John? <laughs> I, I am too. <laughs> it was, I was going to say, I am drawn to this because it is authentic. I mean, everything you say just, just resonates and makes sense. There is no, you know, fluff or it's, and like I said, I, when I try it out in the real world, it, it works. It yeah. makes me feel calm and it just makes me want to study more, learn more. So it's working. Yeah, thank you. You've learned thank you. Jane joined us on our last retreat and has been studying with our Sangha ever since. I'm glad you could join us tonight, Jane. Thank you. Kevin, how about you? Why don't you unmute your mic and say hello? Unless I need to do it. Do I? Kevin? <laughs> No, you're, say hello, Kevin. Hmm, something's wrong. Not Kevin. No, maybe, yeah, <laughs> it's not Kevin. Kevin, I can't hear, I don't know what's wrong with the mic, um, but I'm glad you joined us. Uh, we'll go around the room. Pat, good to see you. Good to see you, John. Good to see everybody. Um, yeah. It's, it, it, isn't it just a very thin film? <laughs> it's, it's just a very thin film that that uh, that acts like a veil. And the Buddha Dhamma practice of the Buddha Dhamma lifts the veil. So that's why we're here. Yeah. Thank you. That, that, that's what a great way to say because it, it really is a very thin veil between ignorance and wisdom. It's right there. Right with us. Thank you. Well, I'm good to see you. Uh, you're over your cold. Good to be back here again. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the challenge for me in, in, uh, in, in reading and even hearing this sutta is to not get bogged down into the details of it. I, I, I'm trying to to get the bigger, the big picture, and keep that in mind. And that, that level of mindfulness uh, is still uh, lacking a bit. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, there are no, <laughs> funnily enough, there are no surprises in, mm -hmm. in this sutta. It just um, describes everything in boring detail <laughs> um, but it's 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 clear it's dry um, <clears throat> and then when you when you get to to the conclusion it's like oh right that's it no surprises this is it yeah back to practice <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's it back to practice and that the uh the nexus to where this where this joins with dependent origination, that clinging and maintaining mm -hmm. as a requisite condition to becoming. You can see it clearly here. It's that self-identification with these things that are completely impersonal that continues becoming further ignorant. And it's gonna take this all this it's, I, to me at least it's gonna take this repetition <clears throat> of all these suttas to just build this yeah. over 
it's over a view. Yeah. Um, right, right view. Uh, it's made up of all this, these smaller uh, understandings. Yeah. Uh, to keep them all in mind. Yeah, it's just that way. Even this setting for this, to Pukasati had a had a pretty good understanding of the Buddha's Dhamma, mm -hmm. and yet the Buddha in his wisdom knew that this is what he needed to to hear. You know, and we're going to come back to this over and over again. This is not going to be a once a year well, teaching. Or something about my cows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, for Pukasati, um, and I think we're even going to we're we're going to do a Truth and Happiness course starting January first. So we'll do that again, and I think I'm going to. You could maybe at the end or squeeze this in there at an appropriate spot too, because I think it'll be it'll fit in that context very well. So, Helen, good to see you tonight. Thank you, good to be here. Um, I'm feeling a little distracted because I I can understand this in the context of self-referential view, but I'm thinking about um, people who are other focused, mm -hmm. not focused on themselves. They're more conscious about people around them or thing, things, events, you know, places, world crises, whatever it is. And so that, I guess that's something I'm going to just be kind of mulling over is how mm -hmm. that fits into this teaching. It's probably too big of something to be pursued. Well, <clears throat> but you know I'm going to try. Yeah. <laughs> so the Buddha awakened in the Loka Sutta that I referenced. The Buddha awakened to and, and looked out on the world and he said, the world is a flame. And to me, this Siddhartha Gautama was the world's most compassionate human being, but he saw things clearly. And he understood that the most important thing, no matter what's going on around us, is to develop a calm and peaceful mind. And in that way, we can be, and he, he proved it. In practicality, he he was of great service to the violence that was not in promoting it and minimizing the violence that was inherent in his time too, uh, and all the other awful things that go on as part of the human life. But that that outwardly focused view is a is is a distractive view, isn't it? And, and it's not right or wrong, but it's often it often provides a, a convenient vehicle for not getting down to the work of understanding yourself. And I see that often. It's not right or wrong. Um, and it relates to the, what the Buddha called himself prior to his awakening. Prior to my awakening, and he always said this, when I was an unawakened bodhisattva, a bodhisattva is a human being who is imbued with great compassion for other human beings. But he understood that that was an unawakened state. He was lacking understanding of the way things truly are. And we all know that there's been horrible tragedies inflicted on other human beings in the name of compassion or helping people along, seeing things correctly. So I don't know if that gets to the, to the, to what you're saying. Um, but when we understand the ordinariness I mean, I got to go. Now that you got me going. The Buddha never saw himself as a savior. He wasn't trying to teach a salvific religion because he knew that that was impossible. It, it con just that idea contradicts the first noble truth. Dukkha occurs in the world. So the most realistic thing to do, and it's what I say often, and it's what's really part of this sutta, the most loving thing I can do for myself and for everyone else is to take to the Dhamma and awaken so that at least I know that I'm not contributing to the suffering of others. So what do you say to people that are, that are so distracted by their, you could say by their compassion, by their need to do good for others? You need to develop some concentration and see things clearly. And you, even you, you, you're, in better, you're better able to take care of the world when you first take care of yourself. And everybody knows that. One of the most important books I've ever read and had nothing to do with Buddhism, it had to do with Christian saints, was the uh, biography of Mother Teresa. And in that, I, and I was stunned when I read this, because I, I was under that belief, like most people, that Mother Teresa was 24-7 out there helping people, and she never stopped. What I read was that for six hours every day, her and the nuns under her charge prayed and meditated so that they were able to go out and help other people. 
they took care of themselves first. And that would, that, isn't it? You do not become awakened the first noble truth. Don't you continually spin your wheels in following the path, but not the right path? Yeah, it's often a substitute. In fact, it's it's the most common substitute for developing the Buddhist teaching is to be an engaged Buddhist. Like and again, I, I don't mean that as, in, as condemnation, it's just what happens. It's like you should find that, no, yeah, we all accept that first noble yeah. truth. And then you want to get on a path, but... Well, but you're, 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 you're living in that non-becoming. The Buddha was the most compassionate person. I can be a Buddhist by being just as compassionate. I'm in the non-becoming. The acceptance of that first noble truth that really puts you on the path. Yes, it is. Because you could just get distracted. Spend your lifetime with you. Because it's not it's that not acceptance of uh, of suffering and disappointment and not being satisfied. Yep. And I think people like zip by it and then they still think that they can have that satisfaction and live a good life. And what does that strategy do? It allows that person Nothing wrong with that person, but it allows that person to ignore ignorance, their own ignorance. Mm -hmm. That's when I, when you, you know, I know you heard me say it. One of the most uh, revelatory things I've learned from having this seat is seeing that because I see it not in you, but in a lot of people. Now, really, in myself too. The, the very powerful and subtle strategies. Matt exampled it the other night. Not example that he he was he saw it. Um, the very powerful and subtle strategies we employ to ignore our own ignorance. Mm. And one of the most predominant and disappointing things that I've come across in modern Buddhism is that much of it is presented as a way to ignore ignorance, ignore the first noble truth. Just what the Buddha said, to, this is what you need to determine your, to do <clears throat> is to develop this understanding. We create strategies so we can avoid that determination. And so the, and getting back to Helen, that was such an important thing that you said. It seems like what could be, the world is a flame, right? What's, I don't have time to meditate or study the Eightfold Path. There's too many people suffering. But why are they suffering? <laughs> because- but I don't think that one is necessarily exclusive of the other. It isn't, but it often plays out that way. But you're right, it's not. And the other thing that they had said made me think of was um, Voltaire's book, Candide. Has anyone read that? Yep. It's very much like the Buddha story. Someone who's raised in privilege and um, has a teacher who's taught him all the good things in the world. And then one day he goes out and sees all the bad things and takes this long journey, experiences all of it, like firsthand becomes involved with things that he never would have mm -hmm. thought of. And it's like the whole journey. And, um, yeah. And I can say, you know, the, the third part of this, what we're discussing here is that <clears throat> the, the focus on, on others is always still in reference to a false self. Yeah. So not, yeah, it is. And, and so that's why it can never really go anywhere. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that we shouldn't, we shouldn't be, and, and that we're not capable of being compassionate and helpful towards others. Of course we are. You know, we, we've been, as a human species, we've been caring and loving and compassionate towards others, despite the fact that we're not awakened yet. So it, 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 it doesn't mean that we have to be awakened to care about others, but that the, the notion of that I need, to be, I need to take care of others often overcomes the need to take care of ourselves as well. And that's and that's the problem. That's the that's the self identification, and it often becomes the justification for something that's wrong. See you, Helen. Thank you, <laughs> Mary. How are you tonight? I'm fine. I'm good. Um, I I'm sort of at a loss for words. I feel. Um, <laughs> a deep sense of understanding mm. um, what needs to be done, the, the, the relinquishing of the veil, that it's so close, you know, that 
it's a difference between clear view and 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 not clear view. Um, you know, makes it all simple. But what we were just saying a minute ago, the the multitude of strategies that we've learned or been taught or have adapted or whatever to um, learn a different way to mm -hmm. relate to the world. Um, to me, that's part of the veil that has to be relinquished and, and surrendered and let go in order to um, like fully integrate all of this. And I think it's the little steps of recognizing it in this behavior or that situation or here and there when you're being self-referential and it's, I think the practice is to recognize that more and more off the cushion because recognition is as close to relinquishing and letting go. Um, and that's what this feels like at the moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If I'm thinking about it in a practical application of my everyday life. Yeah, yeah it is just that. Mm -hmm. And it is in your our everyday mundane life that we develop the Dhamma. Mm -hmm. by, by seeing it that way. Thank yeah. you. That's great. <laughs> David, good to see you, as always. I think you have your teaching. Uh, I guess I know. <laughs> you never say enough. I'm glad you're here tonight. Bonnie, good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you. So this week, um, I'm thinking about this week and last week, and I've just been looking at uh, just so how clearly I think if, if um, just acknowledge what arises, just like, well, it, it's like before it was not said something, it's like it's such a thin veil, but the veil is sort of like sometimes I get a real crystal clear, I get it, like in it maybe in my practice, I get a real clear sense, I can't necessarily verbalize it, but that um, because if I don't, Acknowledge what arises, um, which is paralleling also through meditation and sitting and breathing in and out. But in, as it arises, if, if I don't, then I have this big reaction, and all I, I specifically can feel like what I feel, whether I feel all I feel about this thing that happened, I feel sad or I feel hurt. Okay, and what do I need? What does it want me to, what do I need to do with that? And not needing to do very much, but then learning how to have this container hold mm. and not have to do anything to fix it or change it. And then it can fall away. So then of course that's, you know, if, you know, the, the closer the veil drops, the more you can achieve that. But like we were saying earlier, is that I hear a lot, especially in the, I work with the students in the first half of the program, and they feel like, oh, I have to, it's almost like they're going to save the world. They're going to go out and they're going to save people. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, people come to me all the time, but they never talk about myself. I never work. So I'm done, yeah. you know, but then but there's such unrest and un, I mean, I can't tell you, like I, I had my last class yesterday, and I, it's it's like, I don't even know why I think it's shocking. I've been a therapist for many decades, but how unhappy, how unhappy they are. And they're all oh. trying to hide it and mask it by, they don't even know, they're trying to figure out who they are going to be in the world, but yet they're, so the idea that we have to stick, we have to take care of what arises in us first and then I'm really much more present mm -hmm. in helping someone else because then I'm not going to try to help myself through the helping of someone else. Mm -hmm. That's that's right. right. Yeah. 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 Thanks, Mary. So you often get it confused. If I you know if I can help these other people that makes me better. Oh, and it heals me. Yeah. It's like vicarious like, well it, 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 it's vicarious like nature to think that that you know, I'll be fixed, but and it's um, I think it's a big that's a big lesson 
you know, to, but, you know, the, just the knowledge that arises and see the parallel to the, mm -hmm. the I think I'm connecting the sitting meditation or with my living meditation, the mindfulness thought meditation. Mm -hmm. um, how it uh, is balanced. Yeah, and we were talking about that earlier too. It, it's it is it, it it requires that it requires to take that concentration off your cushion, and support that refined mindfulness, seeing things through the entire eightfold path, and it makes it does make all the difference in the world. Mm -hmm. Especially at moments when you're like really clear, mm -hmm. and then it's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's good to see you. A little bit. Um, good to see you. Good to be here. I, I love what Ron said because this is always what it comes comes down to is the, the looping back. Everything's connected and loops back into all the different principles. And, and you can stop anywhere along the way and say, you know, what is it that I'm forgetting? Or what is it? You know. Um, but tonight was gave me a little potentially some insight into what John Kabat-Zinn does with mindfulness-based stress reduction and pain relief. You know, he does, he has this whole pain program yep. of people in chronic pain and it just sort of all connected. Um, spent the last two days stacking firewood and I was able to say, I'm just stacking firewood. <laughs> Until the log landed on my thumb. <laughs> yeah. And then in my head I said, ow. <laughs> I didn't even say it out loud. I just had kept going, but um, <laughs> it was um, it's interesting to to just to be able to say, oh, it's just cold out instead of cursing the frost on your windshield. You know, mm -hmm. when you go to get in your car and maybe setting yourself off into a wrong view or or whatever. Um, but I, I've been doing some other reading, and one of the one of the things that came up in this first reading was um, the idea of practicing patience. And so you practice patience in traffic. You practice patience in the little ways when the saran wrap gets tangled. You know when your coffee cup, the top, is leaking. You know coming down the front of your clothes you just put on, um, to practice patience in those small things and then it becomes a habit that through the practice you can uh, sort of quiet down some of that conditioning, that first response of spewing because these things happen or whatever. Yeah. Mindful thoughts, mindful things. Yeah. Yeah, those are good opportunities to practice restraint too. And yes. Saran wrap. And then it helps with bigger things. Yeah. Um, I just throw it out. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's all I have. Yeah. All right, Liz. Uh, what a remarkable class. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Kevin, for joining us tonight. Um, so next Tuesday, we'll do part two. I don't know if, it will, if there'll be a part three. We'll see how that goes. And you know, I'm doing the same thing on Saturday. So. This seemed yeah. like such a different energy last week. Remarkable, isn't mm -hmm. it? <laughs> yeah, don't keep mining this stuff. Yeah. Well, that's the thing, the part that I appreciate so much is that, and this is how I learn, you know, you learn it this, and then all of a sudden by learning this, this, there's a complete connection there. And it, you know, it's that feeling of insight. Yeah. The, the only other thing that I wanted to say was something just about people that um, that want to, you know, the constant helping and all of that, that, that it, you know, and I think you pointed this out, but there is a certain amount of ego there attached is. to that. Yeah. Where it's not necessarily all selflessness. You know, there's a, yeah, it's not automatic. Um, yeah, and a lot of a lot of it is that I'll help you as long as you do what I tell you to do. You know, and if you don't, I'm not or, going. Or to. I'm going to do this thing for you because I think this is what you need. 
Yeah. Well, look at look at those guys called the NGOs and the people who work for the NGOs and who are good at it. They're like a mess of exactly and how much ego flying around with that. All rooted in <laughs> ideology, all rooted in mind becoming. You see it in the commercial. Mm -hmm. Or I just I want to appear good. Yeah. But that's all part of the first noble truth and where it comes from. But if I do this to this, then there's a <coughs> what, it, what is right? There's some condition. Yeah. You see it a lot in uh, organized religion. Exactly. Yeah. Someone on the path would feel to give and have no expectation because it's it's selfless. Yeah. Yeah. There's no there's no. This is what it is. It, it, you read the Buddha's it. life. That's what he he didn't. He never charged for it. He got supported through alms, etc., and, and uh, other benefactors. But it was never. Uh, he never did it as a way to establish himself as a great teacher or anything. He, this is just what he did. It's Even the story of. Way. Yeah, and and he what else, and to share it. really what he was what he was exampling, being exemplar was is what else could you do? And much like what Helen was, what else could. What else could an awakened human being do but help? And it's not, you know, it's not even help help dukkha, it's just help. You're helpful because you're not part of the problem anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. But Fine. I did have the thing that I left last week and I was thinking about it. And I and I maybe maybe because I don't I, I, I get that the Buddha wanted it was, you know, interested in having this man understand the Dhamma and that he was learning, and but there's something to me that felt like like trickery in like why didn't like imagine sitting with the Buddha and just sitting there with him, and then you know three hours later you not that it matters who he is, it didn't really doesn't matter how I make him, but you kind of felt like. It was um, like why? Why couldn't he just say, "Hey, <laughs> it's, I a, am, it's a great question." I'm, I'm, because it feels like um, almost like a undercover boss. <laughs> but here, 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 yeah, yeah, from twenty six hundred years ago. Undercover cake the, boss. The, <laughs> the answer is in the the answer is in the sutta, <laughs> and it is it's very subtle. For one, I think I think the Buddha was just I so think he was a bit. He would be prankish. No, it's, he was showing Pukasati that inadvertently Pukasati was seeing this great awakened human being, but only as the six properties. That's all he was with to Pukasati and everyone else. He was just the six properties who happened to have the wisdom of a Buddha. And so within, the, again, it has to be seen in the context. If he started out, it, it's how he understood to teach Pukasati. Because if he started out by saying, you know, you foolish guy, I'm the Buddha. How could he then say, I'm the Buddha, but we all are just six but properties. But then that's me, I, 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 I'm the Buddha. But like, <laughs> I, I have to I mean, there's some way that I see it too that the, that's sort of the metaphor. So as he becomes um, engaged in, in the teaching and he becomes more wise, then he can see this Buddha. Oh well, you also you got to yes, but wait, wait for part two because he does he does address <laughs> well, it and <laughs> and how how Pukasati finally understands who's talking to him, mm. and it's in it's in that it's in that context. So even in this context, we have an awakened human being, but he's entirely ordinary, isn't it? Just like just like tonight here, that human being is still speaking to us, isn't isn't he? In his ordinariness, as he's a person of six properties. But maybe he also at that moment felt, if I can formulate this thought, that. As the same way you repeat things to us in different ways, uh, we 
gain insight and hear what you're saying and learn from it. So maybe, hook, hook, I want to say Pocahontas, right? <laughs> <laughs> <That's right. laughs> that he has heard all oh, this. Pardon me? No, <laughs> that he's heard about all this. Sorry. And so maybe if you took the self of the Buddha out of it, it was just a way for him to hear what he had been hearing in a different way. And that the idea of who the self was that was telling him this falls away. Yes. I, I think that that too. You know what I mean? Like yeah. You yeah, the lack of celebrity is no longer there. The Buddha start. also would. It might be a total <laughs> metaphor. That, That's right. Mm -hmm. That's called On a practical well, matter, the Buddha, as he did in the Ampati text, so that he observed the Sangha, <laughs> and maybe he just wanted to see what who had been teaching this wanderer. Mm -hmm. yeah. True. Yeah. yeah, I mean that's yeah. Is he doing it right? Is he, who, who's out there teaching? My, my that he provided yeah. clarity by. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's there. finish it up <laughs> before Mary goes. I know. I am. That's right. I have to go home and be in Tiffany at nine All in right. the morning. Um, so yeah. So stay house. tuned for <laughs> stay tuned for part two. Um, there was something else I was going to say, but it's getting it's gotten late. So we'll finish with uh, Meta, as we always do. So again, find your relaxed meditation posture. Gently close your eyes, gently close your mouth, and take a moment to become mindful of your in-breath and your out-breath. And these are the Buddha's words on Meta from the Karaniya Meta Sutta. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud or demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove. Wishing in gladness and in safety, may all beings be at ease. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings. Radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will. Whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding. By not holding to fixed views, the pure hearted one, having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. Thank you all for a wonderful class tonight. Thank you, John. Peace. Thank you, John. Thank you for joining online, too. <laughs> Good night, John. Night. Good night, Jane. Good night.